All right. Hello, everyone. This is Marcella Silva, your certified land banking specialist, also known as the Land Baroness. And I am very happy to have and grateful for my good friend, Chip Cross. He's a man of many talents and interests. He's a true leader in his community, for his students, his family, corporations he teaches with. He leads in as far as his family's finances and legacy creation. He's on a continual path of self-improvement and growth, and he is just a wealth of knowledge. So I would, my deep pleasure to welcome Chip onto the program today. Thank you so much, Chip, for coming. Thank you, Marcel. It's an honor to be with you. Absolutely. Let's call. Thank you. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Okay, thanks, Marcella. I live in Marion, North Carolina, which is about 100 miles from Charlotte. It's in Western North Carolina. It's a town I grew up in. Uh, my family was in the textile industry, so um, I I came back. I went to school, went to college, came back to work in the textile industry. Really enjoyed it. Of course, that was um, industry that was downsizing over the years. And so it's actually been, I was counting up how many years ago when I got started in real estate, it was about 23 years ago. So I, I started doing it as a retirement program. So I felt like, okay, I'll buy these properties. I'll use the rental income to help pay them down over time. And then, you know, when I get to the age I am now, everything will be paid for. <laughs> so <laughs> didn't always work out perfectly that way, but um, it was, uh, so, so I had that experience in real estate, and then all the time I've had, uh, I've kept a job. I've had a job. So I worked for three textile companies. I worked for an employers association doing leadership training, and then I've been working at uh, McDowell Technical Community College, which is my background, teaching business classes. But it does give me some flexibility. So uh, my experiences in real estate, um, I was trying to buy things at good prices by foreclosures and different things. Of course, I got hurt in the real estate recession crash or whatever, 2008 to 2010. I had two houses in Charlotte that I lost that had actually quite a bit of equity in them. And um, anyway, that kind of led me though later to start working with some private lenders and to start buying double wide manufactured homes. And so what I would try to do is to buy these at half, at 50% of value. And I would borrow. So when I borrowed from a private lender, it was just like getting it from the bank, but they had a lien on the property. And so we could get good deals by buying them for cash. And, um, but my, my private lender's rule was the one that I had in this town was, you know, I'll only loan you 50%, which kept him protected, kept me protected. And then I guess I'm going into my transition into land banking here, but um, then when the market, so I was buying these for, Roughly twenty-five to thirty thousand. They were worth sixty thousand. I know that sounds really, really low compared to prices now, but these were fifteen hundred, twelve hundred to fifteen hundred square foot double wides on a half acre of land, permanently attached. So then, as the market went up, I, I actually almost spent more on renovating these than I had actually originally bought them for. But the market, you know, the price went up to where. I could sell these for about 150000 but I, I had put a lot of money into renovation and the price of materials had gone up in recent years and the cost of labor had gone up in recent years. So anyway, I know I'm kind of transitioning. Is it okay if I transition into the land banking part and the 1031 exchange? Because this is where I'll get into that. So as well, far as it- Real quick, before we get into that, okay. thank you. I mean, you you have so much information, but it sounds like- <laughs> You've been investing in real estate for quite a long time. Yes, yes, a long time. And you saw, you did you see real estate as a way to create wealth for you and your family? Or why did you even get into it to begin with? I did. I, I saw it as a way to acquire assets and to uh, basically let somebody else pay for it. But the problem is I didn't, you know, I'm going to say that my greatest asset is also my greatest weakness. My greatest asset is my optimism, but sometimes I don't see the downside. And I didn't see the fact that people wouldn't pay, that I had to evict, that I had to do repairs. I never saw any of that. That's why I lost the two houses in Charlotte because people, people quit paying. So anyway, it 
you know, what I would say looking back over that is to be more prepared for the downside, you know, and, and to and to have a better management system in place. Because the one thing that I was good at, I was good at buying them at a discount. And so I was going buying them all within an hour of my um, hometown. The one thing that I wasn't good at was managing them effectively and keeping that damage from getting done to it. I guess I'm going to say here to really have the effect of business, you need people with complementary skills, you know, so, and something that John Maxwell teaches is to get people in their strength area. So I could find the good deal. I could raise the money. I could get people to loan. I mean, somebody asked me one time, they said, how in the world did you ever get $5 million worth of loans? They said, how in the world did you ever convince people to do that? And I said, well, if I can get by my wife, I can get by anybody because <laughs> she's on the really conservative side. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's just kind of a joke. But um, my thing is, you know, I always wanted to protect my private lenders. And so but just using this real simple math, I knew if it was worth 60000 and I only borrowed thirty then they were protected, you know, if something happened. And I wasn't really good all the time at getting private lenders, but I was really good at getting giving good customer service to them. So I would send them reports where they stood. I would put their money in the bank, all this. And so where I really grew my business was getting more money from my current private lenders. Because one guy started out loaning me 30000 he ended up loaning me 300000 you know. And so my biggest thing is... Tr- Number one, think about the other person. If you take care of the other person, then it will work out for you. I, I, I've told my children that, you know, if I'm thinking about myself, that's not the right approach. But but it's always worked for me. If I take care of my private lenders, communicate with them, keep them taken care of, then they'll they'll keep wanting to come back, wanting to come back. I love that. It truly shows you're a man of integrity. And I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing the real deal. You know, people people love to talk about their wins, but it can be vulnerable sharing the the hard times and the losses. So I appreciate you sharing that, Chip. And you know what? All of these experiences grow us as people. So it's things we learn from, right? They do. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah, it wasn't uh it wasn't like I thought it was gonna be. Looking back, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your optimism and now being real with what the real situation is. Because yes. And that's why I always, I have a lot of people who say, oh, I'm sick of tenants, toilets, and termites. And that's, that's Jim. Yes. Yes. That's <laughs> Deal it. with it for real. So yes. how did you learn about doing 1031 exchanges? And well, I, as far as the way I'm, uh, I met you and then the way, you know, you told me about the 1031 exchange about land banking, but I had gone to um, a training for George Antone and he had a hundred people on a Zoom meeting and and one of his, actually it was one of his coaches, it was Heather Russo. I noticed that she knew about all the answers that he was, and he's a very good teacher. He teaches financial literacy and, you know, having assets that grow during times of inflation and, He's very, very good. And um, so I noticed that Heather, he would ask a question to the 100 people, and then and then he would say, Heather, why don't you go ahead and tell them? I didn't know that she was one of his coaches. So uh, I contacted Heather afterwards, but she lives close to Dallas, Texas. And then she introduced me to you. And so when we were talking about investing in land banking, we talked about and and I do want to mention this from a tax standpoint, because I'm just going to get, I've thought about this real simple example. If you bought a property for $100,000 and then you appreciated, de, I'm sorry, depreciated 5000 a year, you held it for 10 years. Then when you sell that, your basis in the property, let's say you sold it for the same 100000 you bought it for, but you're showing a $50,000 profit because on your taxes, because you have reduced your basis, it helps you in the years to offset income. But, you know, you feel like, oh, I really didn't make any money off this, but I have to show a profit. So Mm -hmm. my double wides that I had, I had had them for years. I didn't pay that much for them. 
So I knew that I was going to have a big tax liability. So when you told me about the 1031 exchange, I said, okay, I'll roll this into the land banking. And the other thought process I had, Marcella, was I wanted it. I felt like the double wides, uh, there still may be inflation and appreciation, but I felt like they were kind of peaking out at top value. And I felt like the land banking, after meeting you and talking to you, was a good time to buy it because you're kind of buying for the future. So I felt like I was getting a big bang from my buck because I was selling at the peak and buying on the other side at the lower good bargain. Plus, I I wasn't I was deferring the taxes because in the way the 1031 you introduced me to Catherine Ritthaller of I think it's IPX 1031 Exchange, and so the way this works, the money never comes to you; it goes to a third party. Um, person who handles it and then they invest in the new new part but it but it saves you on your taxes i have done four of these so far and i'm going to estimate that each one of these had a hundred would have had a hundred thousand dollar tax liability so that's four hundred thousand dollars tax liability and also i got to use that money to buy assets and assets that grow during time of inflation and land yes. is one of those real assets that has always beat inflation. So exactly what you were talking about, you that's what you were looking for. And you know what? When you put the intention out there, people come to you. <laughs> I came to you. You came to me. We worked together. And Chip, I mean, I was just thinking, I, I was actually just talking to the owner of the company today and thinking about the properties that you have and everything that's going on there and the new things that are coming in. It's and how much effort have you had to put into your land? Zero. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you for that because you you know, and you let me know about the good deals. And I know that I know that y'all do your research. And Marcella, see, here's the other thing. On the real estate side that I'm doing now that that I did, you cannot find good deals. I mean, real estate is very high. And even in even in my location, people are coming to the North Carolina mountains, you know. You cannot find good deals, but but it's the time to sell and it's the time to buy on your end. And I'm, you know, I'm hearing a lot about the renewable energy and I, and I appreciate all the updates that you give. But yeah, and it's it's a long term. It's a long term, but it's kind of the same principle that I did with the double wides. I bought them, I'm going to say, eight to 10 years ago when there was foreclosures out on the market. It was there's excess supply and demand. So I bought them at a low price. And then they went, they went up, they went way up. But yeah, so I want to sell, I, I'm doing some, and I, I kind of look at, um, I look at kind of in three phases, having a cash flow generator, then maybe trying to use something to try to multiply it with, but then trying to get into long-term growth assets. So the land, that's my goal. That's my end goal is to get them into long-term growth assets. And um, I haven't sold a property in about, six to eight months so i haven't been able to take advantage of some of these but i you know i want to get back on track i'm trying to what i'm trying to do right now is build up some of my capital so i can renovate because i still have some more properties to sell and you know just as soon as i can i hope i can hope i can do some more with you because i'm very happy with what you've um sent my way so far absolutely yeah it's it's it goes back to kind of the quote that you told me earlier and why don't you share what that quote was about being prepared? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, John Wooden said, and he won 10, C 10 NCAA championships with UCLA. And I've read a lot of his books and his leadership training. But he said, when the opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to get prepared. And I know, Marcel, that you will send, when you find really good deals, you'll send it out to your email list. And there's been a lot of incredible ones that I haven't, been, but I know that somebody's been able to take advantage of it. I haven't been able to, but so yeah, that's that's the side that I'm trying to work on now, is to get prepared for these. Right. You know, because um, I think that people, a lot of people, don't realize, like even right now, everybody's wanting to buy in my where I live, and the prices are high. Well, they're buying at the peak. You want to buy when you can get a good deal. And so for me, it's shifting, you know, over over into the land banking. And I know the land banking is not going to last forever either. So, you know, uh, 
it's it's just trying to get prepared. But thank you for sharing all the great deals that you do, and I, I think they're I think they're phenomenal. Absolutely. It, it from our conversations in the past, it sounds like part of the reason why you land like land banking and chose to do 1031 exchange was not only was it that asset that will continue to grow for you, but also because you were realistic about the asset that you already had and the growth potential for that. Is that yes, correct? I feel, yes, I feel like the growth, but I feel like mine had kind of maxed out, you know, so it was time to sell. And here's another thing, Marcella, one of the reasons I didn't want to sell them before is I didn't want the tax liability. You know, so this gives me a, this makes it a win-win if you can run it through the 1031 exchange. And that's why a lot of people are not selling right now because, because of the tax liability, you know, they're going to show a hundred thousand or 200,000 in profit and they're going to have to pay tax on that. Yeah. So, yeah. The 1031 was, you know, I remember you mentioned it to me in the very first one that we did and we had to jump through a few hoops because I was new at doing it then, but, but every, actually, uh, not every single deal, but, uh, well, let's put it this way. Out of four of the sales that I have, we have run them through the 1031 exchange. Mm-hmm. And again, each one of those averaged a hundred thousand profit. I didn't feel like I made that much, <laughs> but, but my basis had been reduced in the property where I'm just going to throw an average number out, uh, 150,000, I had a $50,000 basis. So yes, I had to show a hundred thousand in profit. So at, I mean, I haven't calculated up what the taxes would be on that yet, but that would be a pretty substantial tax liability. Yeah, that is. And I, you know, I really appreciate you bringing up this whole situation about depreciating the asset and that, that, counting against you as a huge tax liability because with with dirt you can't depreciate it it's actually in the irs tax code you can't because it's a non-depreciable asset it just keeps going up especially when we're buying it in the right area and then to now be able to grow not only your money but the government's money for yourself it's tremendous opportunity Yes. yes I and when it. you and and this could always change with government uh, regulations, but at this moment, when you pass it on to the next generation, it eliminates the tax liability. It it defers the tax liability for you. Well, like I say, that can always change. But if it's something you're thinking about as a legacy, then that really, even when you start thinking about compounding the money that you saved in taxes yeah. over, over 20 years. So let's just say that, Marcella, I think a realistic number would be that I've saved $100,000 in taxes. I think that's probably a, a good conservative number, a good realistic number. Well, what can you do with $100,000 over 20 years that you're doing for the land banking, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that could turn into millions. Yes. Millions. Yes. Just from the savings you did by a little tweak procedure that you did that you, you know, take advantage of um, that's available to us. Yeah. It's powerful. Well, I, I, I'm grateful this type of opportunity is available to yourself and other people, myself as well. Uh, so we can keep growing our monies and pass it on. For future generations. I mean, if you think about it, land has always been the big legacy maker for people yes. throughout the world. As, as a matter of fact, the first multimillionaire, Jacob Astor, the first multimillionaire in the US, guess how he did it? With land. I'm sure. <laughs> land banking, buying sure. land in the path of growth in New York. So yes. what do you like most about land banking? The fact that... Um, It's growing. It's doing what it's supposed to without taking any effort on my part. But the fact that it's that it's a passive investment, you know, uh, and because, again, real estate, I mean, you'll you'll there's a lot of gurus that are selling a lot of materials and a lot of books. They'll tell you how wonderful it is. 
but it's time consuming. And so you have to start thinking, what is your time worth? And if you, if you make the right decision with land and you buy it with the right opportunity, that's a major thing you have to do, bring it to us. So, because that's not true with rental property, because there's a lot of variables. There's a lot of moving parts that can go wrong. So what I like, what I like, I guess the way I would answer that, Marcel, is the fact that it's a passive, passive investment. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why I originally did it myself. And I think to an earlier point that you mentioned is, you know, when you were buying rental properties, you had to go out and find those deals. So how much time and effort did that take and knowledge and whatever? Whereas here, you know me and that's all you have to do. <laughs> that's perfect. That's perfect. I mean, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, because one of the things being successful in the real estate in the uh, on this side of it, one of the things I remember putting out there was you got to have deal flow. You get what we call deal flow. You got to be able to get good deals. And, you know, that's that's a very time consuming. All of the things that you're trying to manage in the rental property, you're you're trying to manage the deal flow. You're trying to manage getting the financing lined up. And then you got to do the property and then you got to do the repairs and all this. And then you got to do the property management. I mean, it's a, just a lot harder than people think. And then all of a sudden you're feeling bad because you're thinking I'm not doing a good job. I'm neglecting this. But but sometimes there's just so much moving that you just cannot keep up with it, you know, and we we can we can beat ourselves up. But there's only so much we can do. You know, there's only so much we can do. And uh, again, where, where I was, if I could go back and do it all over again, I would just stick to the things that I was good at. And I would have more of a team to do the rest of it. And so um, definitely having a property management team and all that. But yeah, you're exactly right. When you're actually finding the deals for us, that's incredible because that's the hardest part of getting a good investment. That That's the toughest part. So you're giving me some better ideas to work with you. You know, what, what I really need to focus on is now getting the capital available, getting prepared. And to anybody who's out there, if I could give a suggestion to working with Marcella, you know, if you're thinking about selling something, run it through the 1031 exchange. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who have got property that's peaking out right now, you know, and the reason you're not selling it is two reasons. You don't have another plan to do with the money, of, of what to do with the money, and you don't want the tax liability. So Marcella solves both of your problems for you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easy on all the ends of it, too. It, y yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it's working for you without you having to put any time and effort into it. Yes, it is. And sometimes I'm glad to know that something's working good. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I know. <laughs> I know life is, for me personally, life is good because I got land. <laughs> I got yes. two million square feet of land in the most high growth areas working for me without me having to put any effort into it. And you're That's... right there with me, Chip. Uh, that that's right, Marcella. And you know something. Uh, you're you're saying things that remind me of things. But you know, Robert Kiyosaki, that wrote Rich Dad Poor Dad, said, "You don't focus on your income. You focus on your assets." You know, people who really create, I guess you could say, wealth is their assets. Mm -hmm. But most people over here focusing on the income mm -hmm. that they're making, mm -hmm. and you have to work for the income. So what you what you want to do, and this is what um, George Antone teaches too, what you want to do, you want to acquire appreciating assets. That's your that's your bottom line goal of what you're trying to do. You want to acquire appreciating assets because your assets are going up when you go to bed at night. You know, I mean, when you when you live through the year, your assets have gone up. And I also because I, again, I teach business classes, personal finance, and this, you know, I'm a big believer in financial literacy, but I also keep a personal net worth statement, which I've got my assets on one side, my liabilities, you know, what I owe on the other. And then if you can just do that, appreciation 
is going to increase that, mm-hmm. right? Appreciation is going to increase that every year. I just think land's an incredible opportunity. And, you know, I'm thankful that I met Heather. She introduced me to you, Marcella, and you told me about this. And, you know, I'm going to try to do more. Absolutely. Well, I'm here to support you when you're ready, Chip, as always. But more importantly, thank you for taking the time to be on here to share your knowledge. Maybe that'll help someone else out there. And I just recently heard one of your recent properties that you purchased, the state is putting in billions of dollars, building out new infrastructure right where that property is. So that's- Well, thank you, Marcella. (laughs) That's other developers' monies, other governments' monies working for you while you're living your life over there in North, in, uh, North Carolina, doing your thing and helping people out as well. So anything you want to leave our listeners with? I mean, you've, you've given a lot already. I, I would, thank you, Marcella. I would just um, urge you to consider it, uh, especially if you have something that you feel like you could sell right now in this market. Because if you have, I'll, use, I'll just use a round term. If you have something worth $100,000 and you feel like it's sort of peaking out, then maybe you could put that somewhere else that might could grow to a million dollars. So, you know, always be looking for, for me, it's always looking to move something from where it's peaking out to where it's undervalued. So, because it has a better chance for growth. Absolutely. Yes. And that is a wealthy mindset, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you again, Chip, for spending your time with us today, for sharing your knowledge, your expertise. You're a wonderful person. I am. It is my joy that you are a friend, you are a client, and I get to continue to work with you. And I'm truly grateful. Well, thank you, Marcella. I'm very grateful for you, and uh, I, I appreciate you very much. And it was my honor to be on the call today. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Take care.